In this video, we're going to look at valency and ionic bonding. We're going to look at valency, what it is and how to work it out. Ionic bonding, naming of ionic compounds, some ionic bonding that's a little bit more complicated, as well as polyatomic ions. So firstly, valency. The structure of an atom tells us how it's going to bond. And in particular, what we want to look at is the electrons in the outer shell, and we call these the valence electrons. So the example that we looked at previously was carbon. Carbon has six electrons, two in the inner shell and four in its second shell. So it has four valence electrons. Now, atoms are the most stable when they have full shells. So therefore, we say that all atoms want to have a full outer shell. Now, they're atoms. They don't really want anything, but it's easier for us to think about this and think about atoms wanting to have a full outer shell and be happy if they've got a full outer shell. To do this, there's two ways that they can get a full outer shell. They can either give their valence electrons away to another atom, and we call those ones electron donors, or they can take electrons away from another atom, and we call these electron receivers. So sodium has one valence electron in its outer shell. So for sodium, it's easier for it to give that one electron away than it is to receive seven electrons to get a full outer shell. So therefore, sodium is an electron donor, and it'll give away its electron, and we say that it has a valency of plus one, or one plus, being that it has one extra electron. Chlorine, on the other hand, has seven electrons in its outer shell, or seven valence electrons. A full shell has eight, so it either wants to give away at seven or gain one. Now, it's much easier for it to gain one than it is to give away seven. So it is a electron receiver, and it has a valency of one minus, or it's missing one electron. Because the periodic table is arranged in a way where a column or a group all have the same amount of electrons in the outer shell, we can therefore deduce that all the elements in a particular group or column will have the same valency. You'll also notice that on the left-hand side of the periodic table, where we find the metals, all the metals have a positive valency, while on the right-hand side, the non-metals are all negative. Here are some transition metals that aren't in that first 20. Now transition metals can be a little bit tricky because of the way that their electrons are found in different shells, but some of the common metals that we use in chemistry are silver with a valency of 1 plus, copper which can either have 1 plus or 2 plus, nickel which is 2 plus, lead 2 plus, zinc 2 plus, and iron which can either be 2 plus or 3 plus. Now if you ever come across another metal in the transition metals, just treat it or assume that it is a 2 plus because most of them are. Okay, now we can look at ionic bonding. Now ionic bonding occurs between a metal, metals being electron donors or with a positive valency, and a non-metal being an electron receiver with a negative valency. So sodium, which has a valency of 1 plus, donates its extra electron to chlorine, which is at 1 minus, and forms an ionic bond with that chlorine. Now both atoms are stable is because they have a complete outer shell. So chlorine has three shells, and its outer shell has eight now because it's got that one extra. It had seven, and it's got one extra from the sodium. And sodium has a complete second shell, which has the eight electrons in it. So it did have one electron in its third shell, but now it's got rid of that, so it's only got two shells and stable. When they've bonded, we say that they've formed ions, and the ions that they've formed are charged. And the reason that they're charged is that the number of protons and number of electrons is no longer even. So they start off even, 
but when sodium gives away an electron, it now has one extra proton than electrons. Protons positively charged, so it has a positive charge. And conversely, with the chlorine, which started with an even number of electrons and protons, it's gained an electron, so now it has a negative charge, the chlorine ion. And to show this charge, we write in superscript or above the main line. So sodium is Na plus and chlorine is Cl minus. So naming this new ionic compound, we say the name of the metal followed by the name of the non-metal and we change the name of the non-metal to ide. So we just knock off generally the last three letters or so and put ide, I-D-E on the end. So when we have sodium and chlorine, we take the I and E off, change it for ide, and we have sodium chloride. Now when an atom needs more electrons than another atom is able to give it, what it does is it gets in multiple atoms of the same type. So for example, in here we've got potassium and oxygen. Now the oxygen needs two electrons. It's got a valency of two minus, so it needs two electrons. Potassium only has a valency of one plus, so it's only got one electron to give away. So what happens is one oxygen atom bonds with two potassium atoms, and it takes one electron from each of those potassium atoms, and then all the outer shells are stable. And we can write this in a formula that we have a potassium ion, so K plus, and an oxygen ion, O2 minus, and they go together to form K2O or potassium oxide. Now we use the subscript, so below subscript, to show that there are two potassium ions. So that little two at the bottom says that there's two potassiums and it comes after the element that there's two of. Now polyatomic ions, polyatomic meaning many atoms, are ions that contain more than one element. And they have a set formula and we treat them as one entity so that they don't split up in reactions, they always move together. So an example of a polyatomic ion is a hydroxide ion. Now a hydroxide ion is an oxygen and a hydrogen and it has a negative valency, or minus one. So for example, if we're looking at the bonding between calcium and hydroxide, calcium has two plus, while hydroxide has one minus. So what we need to do is we need to have two hydroxides for each calcium. Now, what we do to show that we have two hydroxides is we put brackets around the whole hydroxide ion. So the OH has brackets around it, and then the two comes after those brackets. If we were, for example, to do CaOH2 without the brackets, that would be telling us that there's one calcium, one oxygen, and two hydrogen ions. But we don't want to do that. We want to show that there's two hydroxide ions, so we have the brackets. And as I said before, this compound is called calcium hydroxide. Now with polyatomic ions, they don't change their name to an iod on the end. Hydroxide already has an iod on the end of it, so it's, uh, it stays the same. But other ones that don't have an iod also stay the same. So we might have sulfate, carbonate, sulfite, nitrite, all these ones, uh, other polyatomic ions, now their name stays the same. In this video we've looked at valency. Valency is the wish for atoms to have full outer electron shells or full valence shells. And we've seen that metals have a positive valency while non-metals have a negative valency. We've looked at ionic bonding being the bonding that occurs between a metal and a non-metal, where the metal gives away an electron, means so an electron donor, to a non-metal, the electron receiver. And we've looked at naming 
ionic compounds in that we say the metal first followed by the non-metal with an ide on the end of it instead of whatever is usually on the end of it. We've looked at how ionic bonding occurs when an atom doesn't have the right amount of electrons to give and in that case you have to get extra atoms of the same element to come in and make up those missing electrons. And we've looked at polyatomic ions or ions that have two or more different elements in them that have a fixed structure and are treated as their own thing. For example, hydroxide, OH minus.